All right, everyone, so this will be the second lecture, um, the second out of two for the 17th, the Tuesday, March 17th makeup class for you all to do. So the first one was pharmacology, um, and then this one will be cardiovascular emergencies. We shuffled things around to, to, to do lectures um, first um, during this uh, extended spring break because we can't do labs or like practical things. So we just move things around. So today um, we did farm and now we'll do cardiovascular. But before we continue, I wanted to um, quickly go through the where you can find your drug sheet. So if you go to your um, ACERIP resources, uh, student resources, medical, you'll see your drug summary chart, which is this thing right here. So I would encourage you to print this out, make flashcards of this. This is, has everything you need to know. The drug, the dose, um, can you give repeat doses, the mechanism, indications, contraindications, how it's given, and side effects. And you need to basically memorize this entire chart. All right, and then it tells you that for nitro and for uh, albuterol, you need to have a prescription uh, to give those medicines to those patients. All right, so this is this is high yield. I would um, start uh, learning this now um, because it's going to keep coming up for the rest of class, and it's uh, it's it's important for you to practice. Great. So now we're going to do cardiovascular emergencies. All right, <clears throat> and once again, here's my email if you have any questions about any content that comes up in this lecture. Um, but this is also high yield for you to, to know the disease states that you'll be seeing out in the field. And so now this is where the real clinical um, uh, element of your course comes in, of learning these diseases and, and um, how they manifest in the field and in people. All right, so first we're going to review the circulatory system, right? So um, heart and uh, vasculature, anatomy and physiology. Um, we'll go through it briefly because you have seen it before. But remember, the heart sits posterior to the sternum. It's surrounded by your lungs. It has three big vessels, or, well, four, I guess, inferior, superior vena cava, the main veins, the aorta, and the pulmonary artery, right? And then there's the right heart and then the left heart and then the kind of how the heart is positioned in the chest is that the right heart is anterior to the left heart so it's kind of rotated and spun around so that can be a little hard to visualize but basically um in med school for some reason we're always asked if you were to like test questions and vignettes always talk about ice picks going into people's chest different rib spaces and the when in doubt, just say the right ventricle because that's the most anterior. But basically, in one of these rib spaces, if you were stabbing an ice pick, you would hit that right ventricle. You can see how it's turned. All right, and then you have our ribs that connect to the sternum. And then in between ribs are intercostal spaces. So here's the first rib, second rib. This is the first intercostal space. So the intercostal space is named based on the rib above it. All right, so this would be one, two, three. This is rib. This is the third intercostal space in the third rib, one, two, three. So intercostal spaces and ribs all the way down. And this is your xiphoid process. You can see the trachea going to the lungs. All right, so the heart itself is the size of a fist, sits right in the chest slightly to the left, and it points kind of down and angled anteriorly. The heart has four chambers. We have our atria and our ventricles. The heart is just a pump, all right, so the pump the ventricles uh, are the pump. The atria are kind of the uh, entryway waiting room into the pump. So blood returns to the atria, goes through the valves into the ventricles, and then is pumped out. And then we have two sides of the pump. We have our right that supplies blood to the, to the lungs only, and the left that supplies blood to the rest of the body. All right, so if you could be a ventricle, you want to be the left ventricle because it gets all the action, right? It's so much more thick muscle compared to the right. So the atria are separated by a septum, and the ventricles are separated by a septum. There's also valves. So valves prevent backflow of blood. So we want blood to go through one way um, in a, one, a unidirectional 
flow. We don't want backflow. So valves prevent backflow. You can imagine if this right ventricle was squirting blood out into the pulmonary artery, which is what we want, but if half of that blood went back into the atria, uh, we would be in a world of hurt. All right, so these valves um, are important to know um, because they are important physiologic structures. So on the right, we have the tricuspid, that is the in between the atrium ventricles, and the left we have the bicuspid between the atrium ventricles. So the tricuspid has three bicusps, uh, the bicuspid has two. All right, so Lynn's mnemonic is you ride a tricycle before you bicycle. All right, then we also have semilunar valves. So um, these have three cusps themselves, each the aortic and the pulmonic valves. So you need to know the names of these valves. Um, all the valves are actually on the same plane, so if you take a knife and cut the heart at the right angle, you can see all the valves in the same plane, so that's kind of cool. But basically, here's it showing the heart in systole, and I can tell because when heart is ejecting blood, the aortic and pulmonic valves are open, and the mitral and tricu the tricuspid and mitral valves are closed. Alright, so blood is coming out towards the screen in this picture. So you can see you see the one, two, three cusps, the one, two cusps of the tricuspid and mitral respectively, and then our aortic and pulmonic valves. And then kind of gross macroscopic uh, things you can see, the valves have this nice uh, thin membranous structure that are connected by these fibrous cords called chordae tendinae that are s themselves attached to actual muscles and they're like little papillary muscles attached to the wall of the heart. So this is a heart that is not doing anything. This is, I guess, maybe, well, it wouldn't be in diastole because something would be open, but all the valves are closed in this picture. So you see the tricuspid, aorta, um, pulmonic, and mitral. So the semilunars, you see the moon-shaped, semilun moon-shaped cusps, pulmonic between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, aortic between the left and the aorta. So here's a picture of those. Um, this is important to, to note. So the blood supply to the heart itself, um, those arteries, and this is um, something you all need to, to learn, and we'll talk about this later, um, is supplied to right. Here's the aortic valve. Imagine I split the aorta and folded it back towards the screen. So it's the circle is now like a sheet of paper. So you see the three cusps next to each other, but you can see little holes. These are ostia for your coronary arteries. So the aorta supplies blood flow to the rest of the body with these big arteries. It goes all the way down to your stomach and all that stuff. Um, but the heart itself gets little arteries just about here that supply it, that supplies the blood to the heart muscle itself. So the blood that's oxygenated in this chamber, um, this muscle is too thick for that oxygen to diffuse to all of the muscle. So it actually gets its own dedicated blood supply from the aorta just after the aortic valve. That's high yield. All right, so let's review how blood f flows through the heart. Oh, this is a nightmare. Okay, so um, practice. You can pause the video, but I'm going to keep going. But practice the order of this, and then I'll uh, tell us the answer as we go through. So first, yeah, so practice doing that. But um, as we keep going, this is the, the correct answer. So first you go through the, the, the vena cava into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve until the right ventricle through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk or pulmonary artery. Then you go through the capillaries of the lungs. Then you come back through the pulmonary veins. Where is that over here? Pulmonary veins into the left atrium through the bicuspid mitral valve into the left ventricle. And then through that, you go through the aortic valve into the aorta. And then you can also go through the coronaries or systemic circulation. The heart also has layers, all right? So just like the lungs had a pleural lining, the heart has a lining too. It's called the pericardium, all right? It's a two-layer sac surrounding the heart. So here is the heart muscle itself, and you can see fluid in between, normal lubricant fluid, just like 
pleural lubricant fluid, um, and then the pericardium surrounding that. All right, so this is a sliced open, and we can see into the heart. So there's the fluid, and then here's the layer. So imagine uh, your heart is a fist, and you take a balloon, and you punch your hand through that balloon. You'll see um, the balloon double back on itself. All right, so the pericardium has a fibrous outer layer, and then a serous inner and outer layer. So there's the myocardium, that means muscle of the heart. This is um, doing all the work is directly attached to the visceral layer. So just like the lungs had a visceral layer that is in direct contact with the parietal layer. But then for extra protection, the lungs don't have this, but there's an extra fibrous layer on top of the parietal, right? So remember uh, if, when I taught you pathophys, we talked about the pleura and how the pleura, the two plural layers of visceral and parietal were attached to each other as a contiguous structure. So here's kind of that loop visualized. All right, because um, if you were to punch your hand into a balloon, um, kind of around your wrist or however far you go, um, the the balloon will double back and start touching your, your skin versus being the exterior layer. So remember visceral means organ, so the visceral layer is on the, or the myocardium, and the parietal means roof, so there's those two uh, terms used again. And then an extra thing the heart has is a fibrous layer, so it has like kind of three components. Then in between the, the uh, pericardium itself is kind of that lubricant fluid, all right? So we talked about all of these things. So the heart wall, so here's the parietal and then the lubricant fluid visceral. The heart wall itself is made up of myocardial myocytes, and these are the muscle cells, and they're striated, but they're kind of irregular uh, st structures. But this is the contractile element. And then you keep going deeper into the heart, and the inner layer, so this is where all the blood would be, is lined by smooth endocardium. That endo means inside, endocardium, all right. So here's a cross section of the heart. So if I were to take a section like this through the heart and open it up, you would see this, this is kind of backwards from what you might be used to, but this is the left ventricle. You can see this nice thick muscle, nice and thick uh, circular muscle. And then the right ventricle actually kind of looks, um, it's kind of floppier. Um, less thick muscle, and it almost has like a kind of a moon curved shape compared to the circular of the um, of the left heart. So, the regulation of function. These are just three terms you should be just familiar with. There's chronotropy. Tropy kind of just uh, the um, just like modification. Chrono like time. So the rate the heart function can be. Increase, decrease rate, so chronotropy. Dromotropy, I'm actually not sure where the um, prefix dromo comes from, but that means the rate of conduction, so the conductivity of how electricity goes through the heart. And then inotropy, so ino, like ions. Remember, um, calcium is important for muscle contraction, so the strength of contraction is directly related to the calcium in the cardiac myocytes themselves. So if I want to regulate how the heart is functioning, I can speed up the rate, I can speed up the, con the conduction of the, the electrical signal, or I can increase the strength of contraction. How all these things are related or regulated? The brain via sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves Right, fight or flight, I need to run faster, so I would increase my inotropy, increase my chronotropy to run away from that bear. My endocrine system hormones, my catecholamines, epi, norepi. So um, these are kind of effectors of our sympathetic nervous system, but are longer acting. So there are alpha one, beta ones, all these things, right? And then blood vessels themselves give feedback to the heart tissue about what's going on. Uh, high yield, alpha 1, remember vasoconstriction, that little lasso around a blood vessel looks like alpha. Beta 1, one heart, two lungs. So beta 1 increases the rate, conduction, and contractility. So chronotropy, dromotropy, inotropy, beta 1. All right. Parasympathetic decreases your heart rate. Rest and digest, I don't need to be running from no bears, so my heart rate can be at rest. Um, parasympathetic, high yield, 
sympathetic affects the whole heart. Parasympathetic doesn't affect the whole heart. It only affects the AV node. Naturally occurring hormones. So we talked about epi, norepi. This is, um, this is useful to know. I'm not sure if you'll be tested on it, but it's useful. So these catecholamines, um, these are just like the classification of these hormones, these neurohormones, um, how they work is these these catecholamines work on all of the receptors, but they have different affinities depending on the receptor. And it is kind of like in the weeds to know exactly how much more affinity and it, it, it varies depending on the dose. And it, it's, it's annoying. So um, I don't have any good mnemonics for you to know this, but norepi is more alpha and epi is more beta. If you have any good mnemonics, please share. Um, I'm I'm trying to learn this myself, but th just know that the catecholamines have differing levels of um, preference for each um, for each type of receptor. Um, so the heart has its own internal wiring system called the conduction system. It coordinates the mechanical pumping action. So you can imagine if every single cardiac myocyte was beating independently of all the other myocytes, we would have a mess on our hands. So we have to have like a conductor of a symphony to um, coordinate all the instruments of the heart, and that's our electrical system. All right, so in response to that stimulus. So the brain controls that conductor ever so slightly through the autonomic nervous system, um, but the heart has its own um, uh, pacemaker itself. So the brain modulates the, in, the heart's pacemaker capacity, but um, if you actually cut out someone's heart, it will beat on its own um, without that brain input. So the brain isn't telling it to beat. The brain is modifying the internal beat of itself. And so if you see a heart transplant or something like that, you actually have to bathe the heart. Once you cut it out, it'll still be beating, and you have to bathe it in a solution to stop the heart's intrinsic um, uh, pacemaker activity. So the heart has unique and it can do its own stimulus. So this is a fun fact. So if you took bio 101 and you had to compare the muscle types, right? Remember you have smooth muscle and you have skeletal muscle and you have cardiac muscle are your three muscle types. All muscles can contract. Skeletal muscle requires a stimulus to contract. So your brain, you're, if you're sitting there, your bicep doesn't contract on its own. Your brain initiates that signal. Same smooth muscle, um, same thing. Your kind of nervous system in your gut, for example, coordinates the um, stimulus for the smooth muscles in your gut to work. The heart, it's the unique thing about cardiac muscle is it can initiate its own stimulus. All right. So in the heart, there's two types of cells. There's the myocardium, the myocardial cells. That's the muscle. Myo means muscle. Cardio, heart. Those are the contract elements that require the electrical impulse um, from the pacemaker cells throughout the heart. And so these cells are kind of splayed out like a wiring system, but are uh, focal in certain areas called nodes, but um, spread throughout the whole heart to to coordinate all the myocardial cells to beat when it is appropriate for them to beat. Um, the cells of the, the cardiac cells are excitable, which means they respond to electric, electrical stimuli. They are automatic. They can generate their own pacer activity. They are conductive. They, the cells transmit electrical activity from one to another, and they are contractile. So they, um, they not only do they respond, but their response is contracting. Uh, great. So the muscle contraction through the initiated through the pacemaker cells through these connections of electrical wiring. So the pacemaker sites, this is in order. So kind of the control center of the heart is this SA node. It is at the superior vena cava atrial junction, sino. So I'm sorry, the coronary sinus atrial junction, SA node. And then that goes through the atria and then lands at the AV, the atrioventricular junction. From the AV node, and we'll go through this in a picture in a second, but the AV node um, pauses a little bit to allow the atria to contract um, all the way into the ventricles. And then through the AV node, we go through the bundle of Hiss, 
through the bundle branches through the, in the septum and then through Purkinje fibers. And each pacemaker site, all of these in this order, has an inherent rate. And as you go down the list, the inherent rate is lower. So the SA node beats the fastest, and so it, 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 it kind of overdrives all the others' intrinsic rate. But if the SA node um, is wiped out, then the AAV junction can take over at a lower rate. So these, this kind of like a, a beautiful backup system in order to, if something goes wrong, something else further down the line can take over, which is super nice. Super nice. So the SA node is a normal pacemaker of the heart. Its inhin inherent rate is 60 to 100. However, it could be modified by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So its intrinsic rate, if I cut it out of someone and leave it on the table for a while, of course not forever, but leave it on the table, it'll beat somewhere between 60 and 100. But um, in the body itself is modulated by sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. So it's located uh, yeah, I was right. The superior vena cava, kind of the, the, the coronary sinus empties right around there and the right atrium. All right. And then um, from the SA node, it goes through multiple pathways into the AV node. Now, this is getting a little, um, little too much in the weeds, so you probably won't be tested on this. But basically, from the SA node to the AV node, there's multiple pathways. But the, this is in the right atrium. The left atrium needs some um, electrical signal, so Bachman's bundle takes right atrium to left atrium, um, and then there's two other pathways from the SA node to the AV node itself. Three, sorry, three pathways from the SA node to AV node, in addition to Bachman's bundle to the left. Um, these pathways initiate a coordinated contraction of the atria all together. So this is a picture format. It's probably more useful than just uh, a, a wall of text. So right here near the SA node is the SA node. SVC, coronary sinus dumps out around here too. But the SA node, sinoatrial, here's our three pathways to our AV node. So it's kind of at the level of the tricuspid valve. And then there's Bachman's bundle that coordinates the left. So when this fires, all four of these pathways contract. So the atria are coordinated in their contraction. Once we get to the AV node, we have a little bit of a pause so that atria can continue to contract to their uh, fullest. And then here's the His bundle. And as we go down the septum, we have two bundle branches, bundle branches, all right? There's the right and left bundle branches that take electricity to the right ventricle and left ventricle respectively so that we can coordinate all the muscle in our ventricles together. Now, at this point, the atria are relaxed, right? Because we are now doing systole of our ventricles to eject blood into the pulmonary artery or the aorta, respectively, all right? So we go through our bundle branches and then all these little fibers, all these little fibers to make sure we get all the muscle all together are the Purkinje system. So I mentioned the AV node at the base of the right atrium next to the tricuspid. It's kind of a gatekeeper for impulses to the ventricles. So uh, this is important to note. So remember I said all of these um, all of these valves are in the same plane. This, this picture doesn't really do it justice, but all the valves are in the same plane. And I talked about how like the, the, the valves are kind of a membranous, fibrous um, structure. So electricity can't go through the valve and the heart muscle isn't in contact with each other in these sites, this this shouldn't show show that. So there's only one site in a healthy person where muscle is in contact um, between the atrium ventricles, and it's in this spot right here in the Hispurkinji system. So that electricity doesn't travel down here. That could be very bad and dangerous if electricity bypasses. So this fibrous layer actually separates here and then separates here and here, and so on, there's only one way for electricity to go in most people. Some people actually have muscle ta uh, from the atria ventricles um, and that, that can be dangerous and cause bad rhythm problems. But in most people, this is the only site for electricity to conduct from the atria ventricles. And so that's how the AV node can act as a gatekeeper. All right. Um, and there's a little bit of a pause so that atria can contract. There's an inherent delay 
in the AV node so that atria contract all together before the ventricles contract. And it has, so the SA node is 60 to 100, it has a slower inherent rate. That's where it is. Then the bundle of Hiss goes to the bundle branches, so right to right, left to left, and then the Purkinje system itself has an inherent rate of 20 to 40. So as you can see, SA 60 to 100, AV 40 to 60, Purkinje 20 to 40. So as you, as you go down, the inherent rate of those cells is less. And so if the SA node were to crump out, the AV node can take over, but it would be at a slower rate and it doesn't have as much sympathetic, parasympathetic um, input compared to the SA node. So if some people might be having too much, might be, might be having bradycardia at a slow rate. So when you check people's pulse, this tells you information. So here's the bundle of Hiss, bundle branches, and Purkinje system. Uh, so I mentioned the intrinsic fire rates of all these things. So for example, if the SA node is firing, this is a little normal heart tracing. Um, if the SA node or atria fail, the AV node will take over. This is called the junction. That makes sense, right? The atria and ventricle junction. It's slower. And if you go even further down and knock out um, the, AV, the uh, junction, then the, the uh, ventricles will take over themselves and they at an even slower rate. So here's those numbers. You don't need to know this. Just know the concept. All right, so the mechanical function of the heart, the cells are the contraction. They, they contract from the electrical stimulation, the atria contract from the top to squirt blood down, and the ventricles contract from the bottom to squirt blood out. The heart generates pressure gradients that drive blood flow through the vascular system. Although the heart appears to be a single structure, it is divided by a central septum into two separate pumps, each consisting of two chambers, the atrium and the ventricle that alternately contract and empty during systole, then relax and fill during diastole. The timing of the electrical and mechanical events in these chambers must be precisely controlled to ensure efficient cardiac function. The timing of atrial and ventricular contractions relies on two primary cell types, cardiac myocytes, which do the mechanical pumping, and autorhythmic cells, which initiate and conduct electrical impulses that drive contractile activity. Autorhythmic cells cyclically depolarize on their own, then fire an action potential each time they reach threshold, a process known as pacemaker activity. This activity originates from primary pacemaker cells in the sinoatrial or SA node in the upper right atrial wall. The pacemaker potentials swiftly move through the interatrial pathway to the left atrium and spread throughout the atrial myocardium via gap junctions. As a result, both atria depolarize and contract as a single unit. The impulses generated by the SA node also rapidly spread through the internodal pathway to the atrioventricular, or AV node, at the base of the right atrium. The AV node is the only point of electrical contact between the atria and ventricles. Here, the impulse is briefly slow, allowing the atria to contract and empty their contents into the ventricle before ventricular depolarization and contraction occur. The impulse travels quickly through the bundle of Hiss within the interventricular septum. The bundle branches into smaller Purkinje fibers that radiate throughout the ventricular myocardium. Action potentials travel quickly through the Purkinje fibers, then spread to the surrounding ventricular myocytes via gap junctions. Depolarization triggers contraction. Repolarization triggers relaxation. The swift spread of the impulse through the specialized conduction system ensures that the ventricles become excited and contract as a unit. The spread of cardiac electrical activity may be recorded using electrodes placed on the body surface. The recording, called the electrocardiogram, or ECG, has several distinct components. The P wave corresponds to atrial depolarization. The QRS complex appears with ventricular depolarization. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization. The P wave initiates atrial contraction, which completes ventricular filling. The QRS complex initiates ventricular contraction, which pumps blood out of the heart.
During this time, the atria repolarize and relax. The T wave initiates ventricular relaxation, during which the ventricles fill once again. One cardiac cycle is complete. All right. Oh, Lord. All right. So a quick check, if you can uh, pause the video, go through these orders, um, and then unpause it when you're ready. I'm just going to keep going. Um, SA node to A to the internodal tracks, to AV to bundle of his to branches, and then to Purkinje system. So we also know our vascular system. So um, arteries carry blood away, normally carry oxygenated blood with the exception of the pulmonary artery from the right ventricle actually has deoxygenated blood but except the pulmonary circuit all arteries carry oxygenated blood and then divide smaller into arterioles and the capillaries where our internal respiration gas exchange occurs into venules into veins which have valves unlike the muscular arteries all right so arteries have a thick layer because they're under high pressure, right? When you do your um, blood pressure measurement, you're, you're, you're listening to the, the blood pressure in systole and then diastole, the pressure here, all right? And these are regulate the peripheral vascular resistance when they constrict or relax. And then we have arteries. So here is the ascending aorta arch and then descending aorta. And then just after the aortic valve, which would be right here, we have a right and left coronary artery. All right, that supplies blood to the heart itself. And then the heart has a vein called the coronary sinus that empties into the right atrium. All right, and then the arch has three branches. It has the brachiocephalic, also called the innominate. So this means arm, head, artery. Then we have, a, off that, we go to the right subclavian under the clavicle, and then right common carotid, so the common branches into the things in the head. And then here's our left common, so this is kind of like an asymmetry. Instead of having four, we have the two on the right are combined initially into this nominant artery. Then the left common and the left subclavian. And then we go down into the... Uh, bottom part of the thorax into the abdomen with our descending aorta. Our capillaries are the smallest vessels, single layer thick, internal respiration, oxygen, nutrients, all the good things, wash away all the bad things, all these things, right? If you're a cell, you want to sit up smack dab right next to that capillary so you can get rid of all your crap and then eat all the food you want, all right? Venules. They're the smallest veins that start carrying deoxygenated blood, and then we start going to veins that have valves to prevent one way, or to, to ensure one way flow. These valves um, are, uh, to, because of the low pressure system, uh, blood could backflow, but valves prevent that, all right? So we also call veins our capacitance system because veins can carry uh, so much blood at a given time because they can stretch and stretch and stretch. So uh, just to remind you of preload and afterload terms, preload is the venous return, the load exerted on the heart um, before contraction, preload and afterload is from arterial resistance. Um, the, 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 the resistance the heart has to work against to get rid, to eject blood, all right? So preload is a big determinant of stroke volume. And then if uh, arteries constrict, that increases afterload, that can decrease cardiac output, all right? And then um, afterload is reflected in our blood pressure. It's important to know our coronary arteries. So this is another picture of the heart. Right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, um, pulmonary artery, aorta. So just off of the aorta, we have our coronary arteries. And you need to know the anatomy here. So we have a right coronary and a left coronary. Also, the abbreviated RCA, LCA. Also, th things have multiple names, which is an annoying for students. 
um, understandably, but this is also called the left main because it will split. All right, so um, the right coronary, left coronary I mentioned, just above the valve called the aortic root in the ascending aorta. Um, and this is high yield. Um, you probably won't be tested on it, but this is clinically useful. All right, so when the heart is in systole, the systolic blood pressure almost prevents um, it's such a high pressure system that it prevents blood flow through the coronaries during systole. So that what happens is the blood flow actually occurs in these arteries during diastole. So um, if your heart is beating too fast, um, so that can actually impede some coronary blood flow um, as well. So. Um, a key little point is the blood flow in these coronaries occurs during diastole, so that's important. So like I mentioned, the RCA, the LCA on the surface of the heart, the left is larger than the right. Remember, if you want to be a ventricle, you want to be that left ventricle, so you need a lot of blood flow to work. And some people have a little bit of variance in distal coronary artery distributions, but everyone has an RCA and LCA, I'm pretty sure. Um, it's kind of like other little smaller branches of these big honking ones um, that have some variation. So let's go through the the arteries in uh, more detail. So the left main, left main, also called the LCA, also called the Widowmaker, that is not a medical term, but if you clot this sucker off, the entire left ventricle has no blood flow, and Kim says, dead meat don't beat. So if you don't have blood flow, you don't get gastric change, you go into anaerobic respiration, uh, tissue dies. If the heart tissue dies, it, it, it doesn't beat. Cardiac output drops precipitously. So if you block here, a whole left ventricle gets no blood flow. That's, that's not good. So it's called the widow maker for that reason. The left main has two uh, big branches. It has the left anterior descending artery, so it branches right about here. So an on the anterior surface, <coughs> it, it goes anterior descending, and then it has a circumflex, so it goes behind the heart. Uh, circumflex means behind, like uh, around, so uh, behind the heart. So the left main branches into the left anterior descending and circumflex. We call the circumflex uh, it's like shorthand, it's called the circ, and the left anterior descending is called the LAD, um, which is annoying as well because it's the left anterior descending artery, so the LAD is left anterior descending dot dot dot. It's, a, it's a LAD, so it should left anterior descending artery, but we just call it LAD, so the LAD. Then the RCA, so this is the heart turned a little bit, so here's the RCA, right? Yeah, my red is a Poor choice for these pictures because of my pointer, but the RCA comes right, right here, all right, and then it has two major branches similar to the left main stem. Okay, so here's the LAD, the circumflex. You can see its shade changes because the circ goes behind, and the two major branches of the RCA is the marginal, so it's on the margin of the heart. If you were to take a snapshot picture and look at the just the edge of the heart from that picture, that would be the margin. So the margin, and then the posterior descending, you can't really see um, unless, well, maybe you can if it's, you can see that like little different shade of color. That's the posterior descending. This applies to, to the underside of the heart. So this is just a little pearl point. Um, when I mentioned that people have different, um, there's some variation in anatomy. This is one of the ones that can sometimes come off the circumflex instead of the right coronary. Um, I think it's like 80% of people have it off the right, um, and then 10%, don't quote me on this, but a different percent have it coming off the circ. So this is kind of um, where some people have different anatomy. All right, and then we talk about the blood. So if you were to take some blood out of me, or yourself, and spin it down in a centrifuge, things would separate based on their mass. So the big honking cells, the red blood cells, will um, take up the bottom half when you spin it, and then the plasma will be separated on top. So of all the fluid you have, 
blood is about 8% of your body weight, so you can see right here. And blood is broken up into these main compartments, the formed elements, this just means red blood cells, white blood cells. You can see some things here, and then plasma of the 50. So remember, this number, 45%, is called your hematocrit. And then your plasma, plasma itself is mostly water, but has some proteins, like your cl clotting factors, albumin, and all that stuff. And then in your, in your plasma, you have electrolytes. So plasma itself is a kind of a watery straw fluid, about more than half of your total blood volume. It has all your good, your good things, electrolytes, carbs, proteins, lipids, amino acids, proteins, all that stuff. Your formed elements, this just means cells, 45% your crit, so your erythrocytes is a fancy word for red blood cells, um, and then it has white blood cells, leukocytes, so erythro means red, leuco means white, so white blood cells, and there's a whole bunch of different types of white blood cell. Also platelets, right, aspirin's antiplatelet, um, these help clot. Additionally, in plasma you have co uh, proteins like coagulation factors. So erythrocytes, these are the most numerous. You have like 4.5 million of these bad boys. Um, they are, they're packed filled with hemoglobin. That's one of my favorite proteins. It is what allows oxygen to be um, uh, dissolved in blood. So hemoglobin binds to oxygen. He, uh, these uh, erythrocytes are disc shaped. They're biconcave, which means they kind of look like a donut. And they give uh, blood that red color. So hemoglobin, that protein, that it has iron. Iron's the key component um, that allows oxygen to bind. Leukocytes are produced by your bone marrow. I mean, erythrocytes are also produced in your bone marrow, but these are kind of your immune system. They make antibodies, they go kill viruses, um, very poignant. They're hopefully killing coronavirus and everyone, um, but th these are kind of your immune, your immune cells. Platelets um, are technically not cells, they're uh, cell fragments. So a big honking cell breaks up into many, many, many small parts called platelets. And thrombo kind of means clot. So these are thrombocytes, clotting, clotting cell component things. All right, so uh, they clump together and kind of um, initiate the, uh, the co coagulation process and then the proteins um, that uh, that help the second part of clotting are made by the liver so platelets are the first part coagulation factors are the second part so platelets are activated when you have an injury right if you cut my arm I want to stop bleeding as soon as possible because I want all the blood I can get all right so I cut my arm platelets will sense tissue damage in that area they will kind of activate and uh, start aggregating and clumping up next to each other and make a temporary clot. And then they will um, um, help the process of more stable clotting factors from the liver to activate forming a protein called thrombin. Thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin and fibrin strands, like all these little strands you see, make a more permanent final clot, and a clot in situ is called a thrombus. All right, so thrombin activates fibrinogen to make fibrin, fibrin strands make your final clot, but platelets are essential in this kind of sequence. We also talk about blood pressure. So remember systole and diastole, your blood pressure that you measure. Systole is when the heart is contracting, the peak pressure it reaches. Diastole is kind of the residual vascular resistance when the heart is relaxed. So a typical blood pressure is your 120 over 80, all right? And this you measure is only in arteries. You're not measuring blood pressure in veins, uh, okay? Because blood pressure in veins is a lot less, and you're not hearing turbulent flow when you pump up a blood pressure cuff. So arteries are high pressure systems, and you have this one way high to low, high pressure in the arteries, low pressure in the veins, and so you get blood flow through arteries, into capillaries, into veins, into the right heart. So a couple questions. What's the name for heart muscle? Myocardium. 
Membranes that surround the heart would be our pericardium. The visceral pericardium has another name called the epicardium, medium yield. Uh, the valve between the right atrium and right ventricle, it's one of my four favorite valves, tricuspid. The valve between the left atrium and left ventricle, another one of my favorite valves, the mitral valve. Two types of semilunars, aortic and pulmonic, right? Cardiac cycle term for contraction. There's a blood pressure as a name. Systole, and then the relaxation is diastole. Two systems of circulation from the heart. Uh, so this one might be a little confusing, but what it's saying is what what sort of uh, circuits do we have? What groups of circulation? Um, and then the hint would be we have a right side that pumps blood to this circulation and a left side that pumps blood to the other. So it's our pulmonic and systemic. The inherent rates for the nodes, you know, maybe medium yield, I don't think you'd be tested on it, but it's good to know. SA node is your 60 to 100, AV 40 to 60, ventricles are 20 to 40. So it's kind of contiguous. The heart pumps blood more forcefully when it's filled and the ventricles are stretched, that principle. So if you remember, back to pathophys is kind of all hearkening to that. That's Starling's Law. Remember, increased preload, increased stretch means the heart will contract uh, more forcefully. So that's Starling's Law. Cardiac output, ooh, this is a throwback. Do you remember? Heart rate times stroke volume. The primary determinant of stroke volume, if you think of Starling's Law, the more stretch, what causes more stretch? More preload. Afterload is the vascular resistance that the heart pumps against. The, when preload increases, what happens? Well, just looking at the things above us, that makes sense that everything would increase, right? Stroke volume increase. The SA node, the right atrium, upper right atrium, the two components of the AV junction, ooh, there's a bundle in there a bundle of hiss and the AV node. What happens to the heart rate if each successive uh, superior pacemaker fails? It'll fall to a lower pacemaker. Yep, the heart rate would decrease. The four unique characteristics. Oh, I don't even know if I can remember this. They're excitable, contractile. That's all I got, right? No, what else is there? They're automatic and conductive, that makes sense. The left main stem supplies blood to what? The left. Coronary artery in the circ. Circ comes off of the left main. The widow maker is called the left main, LCA. The marginal is off of the right. Great. All right, now we're gonna talk about some disease states, acute coronary syndrome, also called ACS. So this is kind of a, um, I was kind of confused by this term the first time I heard it. Acute means kind of in the moment right now, coronary heart muscle syndrome. It, it, I'm not really sure if it's a true syndrome. A syndrome just means a constellation of symptoms and pathological processes. And this ACS is kind of a spectrum of disease in the acute setting, and in kind of one end of the spectrum is heart muscle is irritated, and at the under end of the spectrum is the entire heart is dead, all right? So that's kind of like the way to think about it. So the pathophys of this, the chest pain, the symptomatology of chest pain is related to the heart from ischemia of the cells. So if I, for whatever reason, have decreased flow to my muscle, Remember, blood flow has oxygen. Oxygen is required for aerobic respiration. Um, I would rather my heart undergo aerobic respiration than anaerobic respiration because the heart is beating all the time. From the moment you are four weeks old to the moment you die, um, you're four weeks old in utero, 
your uh, your heart is is beating and it requires so much resources to continue to beat all right so it needs those nutrients and oxygen and so if that if that supply is decreased in any way out if the supply doesn't meet the demand you get ischemia and that causes chest pain classically all right so that tissue starvation will result in death of that tissue if it is not restored. So we call this ischemic heart disease, disease involved in decreased blood flow to part of the heart muscle. So the most um, common cause of this ischemia is from atherosclerosis. So this means, kind of athero is like fatty plaque, sclerosis means hardening, scarring. So this is a, um, this, you've probably heard of this before, kind of plaque in your arteries. Um, plaque isn't freely mobile and scars up, and so it can't really expand or contract. It kind of sits there. And this is a process of aging and poor diet and smoking and high blood pressure and high cholesterol and not exercising. All these kind of being obese, having diabetes, right i mean these things travel together and it's kind of all related to this atherosclerosis vascular disease and it's just not good especially if this occurs in your heart because the you know if this process occurs in your big toe yeah sure i like my big toe but if it falls off you know my my brain and my kidneys aren't aren't going to care too much right but if this process of all this crap going on occurs in your coronary arteries my, every cell in my body depends on my heart to beat, to circulate blood so that they can live. So um, if this occurs in the coronary arteries, is no bueno, all right? So cholesterol, fatty plaques, as these, just like we talked about breathing, it's, is it easier to breathe through a toilet paper roll or a coffee stirrer? Well, same thing. Is the ability to squirt blood through this um, artery easier over here, over here, certainly over here, because the diameter is bigger than over here. So this offers a lot of resistance. And here's a good example of just blood flow being occluded and problem, like uh, just not getting good flow through this artery. So this is a long-term thing. To our knowledge, we don't know how to reverse this process. So um, lifestyle modification and it just how you live your life is huge in preventing this, but once it's formed, it's done. And we've also, um, there's autopsies on teenagers in the US showing that this process already occurs, which is kind of scary that um, just our lifestyle in our society is just conducive to this. So eat healthy, don't eat a lot of fats, exercise when you can. You should get 150 minutes of moderate activity a week. Walking is moderate activity. Walk places. Don't smoke. Control blood pressure if you have high blood pressure. Don't be obese. You know, all these things. Um, health behaviors to prevent this process because it's irreversible. And it can eventually result in complete occlusion, which leads to tissue death. Another process that occurs is called arteriosclerosis. This is kind of also from high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol problems. This just means the arteries are stiffened. So athero and arterio kind of occur together. Um, this, if, if you have a stiffened artery, um, it is less ex, uh, expansile to accommodate blood flow. All right, so this is caused by high blood pressure leading to infiltrated proteins and, and gunk into the, the, the vessel wall. This is also a process of aging. So here's another example of cross-section of atherosclerosis. So um, the, the, all this fatty deposit occurs in a plaque, but sometimes what can happen is this, there's a fibrous cap right on top. And if that fibrous cap ruptures, your body thinks that this is like a bleed or some sort. And so platelets will rush to it. And they'll rush to it and try to plug up this, this injury because normally you have fats and, and proteins um, in the interstitium surrounding arteries. And so if you have an injury to the artery, those fats and proteins are exposed into the bloodstream and your platelets are constantly surveying for injury because we want to plug up bleeds. But if this occurs in the lumen of the artery and that fibrous plaque ruptures, 
your body thinks that this is a bleed or like a um, exposure to the interstitium and so it wants to clot off if it can and so this is where a slow going process can suddenly lead to an acute event if it ruptures and that would make a clot further limiting that flow so this is like a year long this is years and years and years of developing this plaque but all of a sudden, if that ruptures, you can have a, a clot form and, and, and even completely occlude the entire way. Now that clot can stay in place in situ called a thrombus, or that clot can also break loose and travel distal in the arterial system ca um, caused, uh, called an embolism. So um, here is an example of a, an artery that has a pre-existing plaque and then here is a clot that, oh, it's a fast moving clot. Man, it came out of, um, fresh out of Dodge or something like that. So it, it broke off somewhere. So now it's an embolism. And you can tell if this plaque weren't here, maybe it could have passed through and gone somewhere else. But no, it's going to get stuck here because it's the rate limiting step now. And so um, if you have small clots from another place that travel, um, atherosclerosis could. Uh, make it cause those uh, clots to get stuck there. Um, yeah, great. So coronary artery disease we've kind of talked about. So here is um, some examples of the coronary arteries splayed open. You can see plaque already formed here. Here is a clot that causes a complete occlusion of the artery. Probably autopsy specimens. Oh, can I play this video? Sad. Okay. I'll play those videos later. But we're going to talk about acute coronary syndrome. So ACS results in conditions in which the arteries are narrowed by plaque, by spasm, right? You can have vasospasm of arteries, and that can cause acute coronary syndrome. You can have a clot either that forms on a plaque or a clot that travels there. So acute coronary syndrome, this constellation of problems and symptomatology and clinical findings for this patient. Um, that causes coronary damage. It can be from all these things. A combination, narrowing by plaque, spasms, clots, all these things. It can be a temporary situation called angina, or so that's kind of your heart is irritated, tissue's not dead, or it can progress to an, a myocardial infarction, acute myocardial infarction. Infarction means no blood flow and tissue death. All right, so ischemia is like diminished blood flow with tissue irritation. Infarct is tissue damage, and, and, ir and if it's in the heart, it's irreversible. Myocytes don't regenerate. All right, so the signs and symptoms of uh, angina and uh, infarction are similar and is, is, is hard to impossible to tell the difference between these two um, edges of the spectrum in the field in EMS. It requires being in a hospital and having more um, resources at the uh, emergency department's disposal. All right, but so anytime you go to someone with the syn with the su syndrome suggestive of angina or an infarction, it'll look similar, so you can't tell. So you have to treat all these patients very similarly. So on one end of the syndrome is angina. Um, this just means pain. Pectoris means uh, of the chest, so chest pain, um, fancy name. So here's an example. This patient has atherosclerosis in all of his arteries. And so you can tell with this athero and arteriosclerosis, maybe blood flow is chronically diminished to this muscle. And so there's no actual death, but it's ischemic. So the supply outmatches the demand of the heart and the patient would experience pain in their chest most classically. We'll talk about the symptoms later, but um, this is kind of one end of the spectrum where uh, just the heart muscle is ischemic. So usually a symptom of atherosclerosis, pain is brief, it is brought on by exertion, stress, cold, <laughs> cold weather, I'm not completely sure about, um, but what happens is they get this pain, they go to, they, 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 they rest and it goes away because now the demand of the heart for oxygen when they're, when they're in 
exerting is high, but when they rest is low. So then the, the supply that is decreased matches when they rest, so they don't have the pain anymore. So that's called angina. It's like stable angina. So that's the kind of the components of angina. There's three, three components that you need to know. One, it's chest pain, substernal chest pain. Two, it's brought on by uh, exertion, stress, all that stuff. And three, it goes away with rest. Those are what we call typical angina. The heart rhythm on EKG doesn't change. And another thing that can be used, so it, it, pain uh, relieved with rest or nitro. So remember, we talked about nitro for pharmacology. This is why a medicine you can give is nitro. This is why patients with angina chronically will carry nitro. Um, nitro is a vasodilator, and so it reduces afterload and preload to the heart. And so that decreases oxygen demand of the heart. And so this, the diminished supply now doesn't have uh, now can meet the demand a little bit better. So these patients usually get nitro. So some signs and symptoms. Um, this, When it's angina and there's no actual dead tissue, it's just a partial occlusion of the artery because there's still some blood flow. There's still meeting some demand. It's just not enough. Usually people will have um, discomfort. They'll describe it as pressure, maybe squeezing, just tightness, aching, crushing, heaviness. You'll hear a lot of different terms. They'll say an elephant is sitting on my chest, all that stuff. And that's usually substernal, right under the sternum. And your body is very bad at distinguishing pain signals from um, organs compared to skin. So if you cut your leg, you know exactly where that cut is. Um, it's hard to miss. But if you kind of have a stomach ache, you know, you feel upset all over your stomach, even though the, it, the problem might be in one specific spot. So the same principle for your heart. When your heart is undergoing um, a problem because it's an organ, its pain signals are very poorly delineated. And so your body can uh, confuse signals as if it's um, a jaw pain or an arm pain. So if you see radiating pain to these parts, that's a problem. That's why we go through our OPQRST. They might have shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, sweating. I always tell, when I teach lifeguard uh, classes, but if you ever see someone with like multiple organ system complaints, like, oh, I'm sweaty, I feel pale, I feel nauseous, and I'm having trouble breathing, always think cardiac in origin as a unifying problem, all right? So stable angina, also angina pectoris. Blood flow is still going, it's just diminished, and it's reversible but it can progress. So kind of as we go from one end of the spectrum, we're advancing through, we can get unstable angina where it differs from the patient's baseline. Maybe it's occurring more frequently. They don't have to exert as much. It's lasting longer. It's not relieved. It, this is a warning sign. Um, so some people may chronically have angina, but if it's getting worse, it could be unstable. It's progressing. All right, maybe a little, maybe the plaque built up a little further maybe a little clot formed, but there's still blood flow or something like that. So it may, this may quickly progress to a, a full infarct. So unstable an angina um, can be treated with antiplatelet therapy. So all these patients we're giving nitro, we're giving plate uh, aspirin to, um, but if there's an actual attack uh, with an infarct, there's permanent damage. With unstable angina, there's no damage to the myocardium yet but they need, they need medical therapy and possibly um, surgical interventions um, uh, down the line. But if someone's having stable or unstable angina or having a full infarction of their heart, you can't distinguish. It requires um, a lot more resources at, dis at the disposal of the emergency room to distinguish that. That's why it's so hard. So anyone having these symptoms uh, should, should go to the hospital. So this is just an example of progression to full heart attack. So heart attack is an infarction. There's a clot, no blood flow through. This is a very weird looking clot, but no blood flow further. Dead meat don't beat. Tissue back here will start dying. So an, an acute myocardial infarction, the lumen is fully occluded from a thrombus. So usually that plaque forms or something like that. Now when when heart muscle dies, it won't beat, 
but is also pro-arrhythmogenic, which means it makes unstable heart rhythms, and that can kill people quicker than uh, the progression of all the heart tissue dying itself. So there's kind of um, electrical changes as well to dead tissue. So an infarct, myocardial infarction, leading cause of death in the US, the number one cause of death is cardiovascular disease. The pain um, pain of this infarct signals death of the heart uh, muscle. Cells begin to die within 30 minutes without getting oxygen. Um, if you have an area distal to a clot in six hours, 90% of those cells will be dead. So this is a very critical, time-sensitive um, uh, endeavor for EMS and the hospital to treat these patients. Um, arrhythmias can begin early after the infarct, and this is what kills people. And you'll learn when we talk about resuscitation and CPR, you'll learn about defibrillation. And usually what happens is when heart tissue is dying, the electrical rhythm gets really angry and goes out of whack and all the muscles beats irregularly and we call that V-fib. And even tissue that is not dying as normal, electrical rhythm abnormalities spread from areas of one heart to, from part of the heart to the rest of the heart. Because remember, we have to have a good coordinated conductor of the orchestra and if every, if, <laughs> If a tenth of the orchestra is on the stage dying and the chaos breaks out with the rest of the orchestra because they don't want to die, maybe it's a coronavirus outbreak. Um, the conductor can't control them. So that is, uh, even though only a small part is dying, the whole heart can fail. The show must go on, so we need to fix that. All right. So remember, this is high yield, okay? Women, diabetics, and elderly have atypical signs and symptoms of angina. So uh, when a lot of the signs and symptoms were being delineated for uh, medical students and doctors, um, a lot of it, men present in a different way than these populations. Um, for whatever reason, we're not completely sure why women um, have different symptomatology. Um, uh, but they they have different signs and symptoms of angina. Diabetics is easy to explain because diabetes tends to affect people's nerves um, over the long period of time. That's why diabetics have foot problems. They can't feel their feet. They go blind. Um, it's a lot of nerve damage, and so the same principle applies if the nerves to the heart um, are, are damaged. They can't sense the the tissue damage as well as someone who has intact nerves. Elderly, same thing. Elderly people, just the, the problems of aging, you get neuropathy, same, like diabetics, just not as uh, progressive and um, rapid as diabetics. And women, we don't completely understand. But when we say atypical signs and symptoms, when we say typical, we mean chest pain rating to the arm and jaw. But these three groups may have more other signs. So the nausea, the belly pain, maybe jaw pain, maybe back pain, shoulder pain. They might look sweaty and pale. Not really, And you ask, is your chest hurting? And they say no. That's kind of atypical angina. And so with these populations, you have to have extra index of suspicion if they have risk factors. Uh, right, elderly women who are obese and have hypertension who call you because they're having a little trouble breathing and they look a little sweaty, think cardiac in origin. Diabetics are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease and certainly elderly are as well. So um, just because someone doesn't have chest pain doesn't mean they're not having an infarction or angina. All right, so I'm sure this guy is in almost like every lecture, but the care of these patients, always your primary assessment. Remember M, A, B, O, C, so oxygen, breathing and oxygenation. Do a pulse oximeter, right? You were assessing the oxygenation to give them emergency oxygen. Um, give this is, this, is, this is now where you're getting into your medical block, right? The other interventions you can do. We'll give aspirin. Now here's a pop quiz. Do you remember the dose? All right, you're going to start needing to know that. All right, so aspirin, you give 324 
milligrams or 80, in the form of 81 milligrams tablets times four. All right, and then you can give nitro if they have a prescription. Do you remember the dose? 0.4 milligrams per spray sublingual as long as, do you remember the contraindications? As long as your systolic blood pressure, she's taking the blood pressure, uh, is over 100. They are, they have a normal heart rate. They're not taking ED drugs, no head trauma, right? In all of these acute coronary syndrome patients, you should get ALS involved because ALS can do EKGs and do other interventions to help stabilize um, the, the, the tissue damage and, or mitigate the tissue damage. So infarction, we've been talking about this this whole time. I don't know why there's a separate slide, but um, pain is generally sudden, right? That plaque ruptures, all of a sudden the clot forms um, and tissue starts dying. That's pretty sudden versus angina, which is gradually patients might restrict their activities because they, they have that slow growing atherosclerosis. But an MI is typically sudden. Uh, the pain is not in pleuritic, typically. Sometimes it can be. So just because it's non, just because pain is pleuritic doesn't mean it's not an MI. So pleuritic pain means worsened with inspiration or movement. All right. So MI can be pleuritic. So this is this is like a rule of um, it leans you in one direction versus another. Pain typically lasts longer than 15 minutes. So remember, stable angina got better with rest and lasted only uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Well. In, MI, because of the oxygen demand uh, decreased when they rest. But an MI, if a clot is there, the, the demand isn't going to change with rest because the clot's there. So the, 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 the supply will not be fixed. So the pain lasts longer. Um, sometimes you press on people's chest, um, it won't reproduce the pain they're feeling, the chest pain. Um, however, it can be. So this is, is another thing like pleuritic. It can lean you in direction. If you press on someone's chest and it hurts a, a, on a rib, hey, maybe they just like broke a rib or something like that. But um, and they're not having a heart attack. But myocardial infarctions can sometimes have reproducible chest pain, but it's typically not. Same thing with typically not pleuritic. And some patients may mistake the pain for indigestion. Remember that pain signals in organs are mixed up and your heart sits right on top of your diaphragm, which is right on top of your stomach. And so um, patients may sometimes mistake that sensation for like a little bit of heartburn. So the classic heart attack is, is an MI. If blood flow is not restored, um, tissue dies for the rest of your life. It doesn't regenerate. So we want to restore that flow. So when you get to a, a heart uh, center, transport them quickly all right and the death of tissue means the heart can't pump dead meat don't beat they can lead to cardiac arrest and now the whole body isn't getting oxygen is going undergoing ischemia infarction rather than just the heart oh. so here is a comparison remember we cannot do this definitively in the field you can only definitively do this in the hospital when they have a lot more resources. So this is like a rule of thumb, but anytime someone presents with angina, you should take it as seriously as if it's an MI because uh, you can't tell the difference. So kind of uh, the, the shared characteristics, the location and radiation are the same. So remember, this is a spectrum. Here's tissue is dying. Here's tissue is ischemic. It can get, uh, it can progress in that spectrum. That's ACS. The nature more intense with an MI. Duration, it's persistent. This, it goes away with rest, typically. Precipitating factors, the MI is a clot form. So it's not like they were walking or something like uh, precipitated, they're, they're clot forming, it just happens. So uh, that can help you differentiate a little bit, lean you in one more direction. Nitro, at the bottom of the screen here, nitro may not give complete relief. Um, whereas in angina, it may give relief and stopping the activity may give relief. All right. Some physical findings on exam. They may have pale, cool, clammy. Remember, pale, cool, clammy is always bad. Sweaty skin, gray, blue. Mental status. They may have a sense of impending doom. All right. Um, pulse. Uh, because the uh, t blood supply to the rest of the body is impeded a little bit, you'll have an increased heart rate. However, 
the, the infarction can actually occur in those electrical signals and you can actually get bradycardia. Or it could be irregular because you could have an arrhythmia. So this doesn't really tell you much. Blood pressure could be normal, elevated, or low depending on the function of the heart and they may be labored or non-labored breathing. Remember, atypical symptoms in these populations, they may only have weakness as a primary symptom, so that's very vague, right? You go to someone who's complaining of weakness, you have to have a uh, MI still on your uh, differential because you don't want to miss it because it's, it's serious, right? Other symptoms, weakness, shortness of breath, arm pain because of that radiation. So how you... How do you try to help them? Give supplemental oxygen because at least if the tissue is um, ischemic, if you increase the the supply, the blood supply that's there, if it's if this fixed amount of blood supply has more oxygen in it, you might be able to help with the demand problem. So you give uh, some oxygen, but you don't want to give too much, right? So maintain stats over 95. You don't need to give non breather to 100% if you can get the same thing with a low amount of uh, oxygen. 324, 325 oxygen, like I mentioned, and then nitro, Q5 minutes times three, provided they don't need a contraindication and provided they have a prescription. However, here is a great example where someone may have a first presentation of a heart attack and they don't have chronic angina and technically as EMT basics, you require, the patient has to have a prescription for you to give nitro, but if this is a first presentation and they don't have a prescription for nitro, if you suspect acute coronary syndrome and they don't have a, a prescription, you can call medical control to get permission to give nitro. And that could be uh, very worthwhile for that patient. So this is an example of some time you may need to call medical control to get permission to give uh, nit nitroglycerin. Definitive treatment at a hospital is critical. It requires surgery and cardiology and all that stuff. So time is muscle. As I mentioned, aspirin antiplatelet, that, pl that uh, blood clot is being, uh, would, would be, the, the size might be, the progression of it might be less. If you give aspirin, it doesn't really break up the clot, but aspirin can help decrease additional clots forming. Nitro reduces the um, size of the arteries, decreasing workload of the heart. But remember your contraindications. So here's your Brady book, 90. Uh, North Carolina is 100. All right, and then the ED drugs, head trauma, and the heart rate contraindications. So treatment of an MI, you need to go to a facility with something called PCI. That's percutaneous coronary intervention. So that just means um, cardiology, heart doctors are able to maybe put stents into the arteries to open up the arteries and to break up clots. So that restores blood flow to the muscle. So yeah, to the muscle. So, so time is muscle. So in, these are the definitive management um, things. Just aspirin isn't going to fix this problem. They need to go to a cath lab. So here's an example of angioplasty. That just means ballooning open um, the, the plaque. And then you can keep a stent in place to keep it permanently open. So if someone is having an MI, you can thread this uh, guide wire balloon, open it up, put a stent in to keep the blood flow open. Okay, so that's MI and acute coronary syndrome. So make sure you understand um, conceptually the difference between the ends of the spectrum, the stable angina, unstable angina, infarction, but also understand that you can't differentiate it without being in a hospital. Um, and so that all those patients who have the same picture of symptoms need to go to the hospital and get the same treatment of aspirin, nitro, oxygen, rapid transport, call ALS. All right, now we're going to talk about more cardiovascular emergencies. We're going to talk about aneurysms and dissections. So an aneurysm just means a ballooning out of the wall of a blood vessel, typically are in arteries and typically are in the aorta because the aorta is the highest pressure artery. All right, so high pressure pushing up against a weak wall can balloon it out. So a weak area begins to dilate, balloon outwards, and this often occurs in the abdomen. And you can tell this would be um, extremely bad if it ruptures. 
So some signs and symptoms of a, we call this a triple A, a um, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, a triple A. Um, some signs and symptoms, when you do a abdominal exam, you may feel a pulsating mass in their belly. That would be abnormal. So uh, if you feel a pulsating mass in their belly, uh, go to the hospital. They may have uh, pain in their back or their abdomen or their flanks. All right, so the aorta is kind of, it overlays the vertebral bodies, and so your body can't tell pain signals if it's um, stretching the aorta. So they may have referred pain to the back. So kind of um, a big circle around their, their belly, any pain anywhere around that circle could be concerning for a AAA. If that rupture acutely occurs, um, you will bleed out very quickly. So you might get tachycardia to try to increase your cardiac output. You're going to go into hypovolemic shock, right? So you'll get sweaty, pale, clammy. They may pass out because they don't have blood flow to their head, all that stuff. Um, a dissection is kind of a different pathologic process. Basically, your arteries have three layers. There's the internal layer called the intima. The media is the middle. And the adventitia is the outer layer. And the, the adventitia keeps everything bundled inside. The media is um, is the expansive contractile. It, it deals with all the stress um, of the high pressure system. And the intima is kind of like a slick lining. This The intima is what is infiltrated with uh, cardiac, or sorry, with atherosclerosis. So if there's a tear in that layer, you can actually bleed into the arterial wall itself. All right, and that causes a separation of the wall. This most often occurs in the thoracic aorta. Uh, the, the, the pain classically is called sharp, tearing, ripping pain. Um, because it's in the thoracic part of your aorta, you'll, they may have pain in their back or their arms. It can actually propagate down into the abdomen, so you can have flank and belly pain too. Um, you might have, diff if it's affecting different vessels, you may have differential blood pressures. So if you suspect a dissection, check blood pressures on both arms. However, that's only present in a minority of patients, but if you see it, it could be suggestive of a dissection. All right. And then you may have a syncope as uh, the only symptom. So that could be uh, concerning. For a triple A, ABCs, high O2, BVM if you need to, transport. These patients are very tenuous and can circle the drain very quickly. All right, so that's dissection. Same, sim, similar with a uh, dissection. Um, ABCs, that's where BLS comes in. ABCs, oxygen, ventilate if you need to. Uh, there's not much. ALS or you can do. They really need to get to the hospital very quickly. All right, heart failure. So heart failure is sometimes a, a complicated concept for students um, to really grasp, but heart failure basically means that the muscle itself is weaker. The contractile elements are weaker. So if you lift, if you do some bicep curls, and you're lifting the same weight over and over and over, and then finally you can't lift that weight anymore and you're not even contracting, that's kind of like bicep failure. Well, the same thing happens to your heart, right? Your heart beats your whole life, and it can't. if it can't do the work, then um, if it can't eject that blood, you're gonna have problems perfusing your organs. Now, there's kind of two problems with heart failure. One is the problems with forward flow, and two, if you don't have forward flow, you build up flow backwards, all right? So those are the two kind of things to think about. So here's a normal heart, blood flow is flowing normally, but if we have um, left-sided heart failure, we're not pumping blood fully through the aorta, and because we're not fully pumping blood through, we may get back flow of um, build up, back build up of pressure in the pulmonary arteries, all right? So there is a difference between right heart failure and left heart failure. And a pearl to know is right heart failure, um, how it manifests is what is distal to the right heart is your peripheral system, right? So 
if I have blood backup from the right, it's going to pool in my legs. If I'm if I'm uh, if if I'm really worse for wear, it may all go up into my belly. My liver might get enlarged. If I'm bedridden, my the dependent part of my body is my sacrum, and you can have sacral edema, right? Pedal edema, sacral edema. So right-sided heart failure leads to peripheral edema, and you can actually see it pitting on people. Um, it's pretty gross. If you push on their legs, you can kind of push into this. It's almost like a sponge, and sometimes fluid will seep out. It's kind of gross. Um, that's from right heart failure. Left heart failure, what is distal in the circulation to the left heart? Well, it would be the lungs. And so if you have left heart failure, you frequently present with pulmonary edema. All right, so high pressures in the pulmonary circulation, just like high pressures in the, in the, in the pedal circulation would lead to pedal edema, same thing happens in the lungs, pulmonary edema. And that can lead to poor gas exchange and hypoxia. All right, so that's important to know. One, you have a problem with forward flow and a problem with backward um, pressure. And two, right versus left heart failure. However, the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. That's another thing to know. So right heart failure, most common left heart, but um, lung disease, uh, problems uh, pumping blood through the lungs from like lung disease can cause the heart, the right heart to fail, leading to uh, peripheral edema, JVD, liver enlargement, sacral edema if they're bedridden. All right, so know the difference between left and right heart failure. If it's bad enough, it can lead to shock. That means the forward flow is so bad that we're not even perfusing our organs. So this can be from either sided heart failure. We're not meeting our demands. Here's an example of peripheral edema. I'm sure the, the these are some slick slippers, but I mean, you can tell that this is not her normal um, leg. This is edematous, it's full of fluid, and it can be pitting where you touch it and it just leaves an imprint of your hand or of your fingers. It's gnarly, all right? So this would be from right heart failure. But if it's left heart, you get pulmonary edema. And so pulmonary edema, when you listen to someone's lungs, you'll hear crackles. So that sounds like if you were to put a straw in some milk or Sprite or something and you blow bubbles, that's kind of what crackles sound like. So fluid in the alveoli sounds like crackles. And then edema in other areas of the body is enlargement, swollen, and durated. All right. So heart failure can be from um, chronic over time, or you could have an acute heart failure from dead meat don't beat, heart uh, MI. All right. So uh, you can see that with either chronic heart failure or acute from an infarction. So she just she doesn't look in she doesn't look in distress too much, but this is just to show a sign of symptoms of heart failure. Maybe we're confused because we're not perfusing our brain. Blue cyanosis. We're not getting enough oxygen. Tachypnea. Pink frothy sputum. Anytime you hear pink frothy sputum, think pulmonary edema secondary to heart failure. Uh, blood pre This doesn't really help you. Yeah. If they have blood pressure, there you go. Rapid heart rate. Desire to sit upright. Ooh, this is a good one. Why do you think that is? Why do you think sitting upright versus laying down is um, is important? A hint. Think of fluid in the lungs. And then another hint is think of what that fluid would do if you lay down versus sit up. And the answer is if I sit up, all the fluid in my lungs would settle out um, inferiorly, kind of like on my de uh, on the on on the lower half of my chest, right? And then the whole rest of my lung would be available for gas exchange. Now that same volume, if I lay down. Now my entire back kind of layers out with fluid and I knock out a lot more alveoli and so I would have more trouble breathing if I were to lay down. So patients with heart failure frequently will sit up in a chair or sit with pillows to sleep um, because if they lay down they can't breathe. So that's this is actually important. You might see edema, distension, pale cool clammy, never good, crackles, and then JVD, right, that's your right heart failing, you'll see the JVD. For heart failure exacerbations, oxygen, nitro for, 
for pulmonary edema and CPAP. Um, when we do respiratory and you'll practice, you'll learn about CPAP, but uh, CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. That positive pressure in the lungs can help push fluid from the lungs back into the circulation to recruit alveoli that were initially drowning with fluid. All right, um, so it's important to um, consider CPAP and EMT basics can now do CPAP that when I took this class that wasn't that wasn't the case and so that's a new thing you can do I just realized in this picture this is kind of creepy this like doll thing what the hell okay let's keep going um, other things to think about for cardiovascular emergencies would be hypertensive emergencies um, a hypertensive emergency occurs with a systolic of 160 or higher or a rapid change and and either or uh, systolic or diastolic. Now, uh, I think this number is, it, depending on where you read, this could be different. I learned it as 180. Um, just no high blood pressure is, is not good. So some signs and symptoms you'll see, sudden onset headache, bounding strong pulses because of the high pressure, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, um, warm flushed skin. You might burst blood vessels and get nosebleeds. You could have s sudden onset flash edema because of the high pressure, dizziness, alter male status and you can actually have seizures. For a crisis, um, a cause, uh, cocaine can cause it. Cocaine has alpha adrenergic effects. Um, do you remember a drug that we can give that has alpha effects? Uh, there's actually two. Oxymetazoline for afrin and epinephrine. All right, so drugs can cause high blood pressure. Amphetamines, Thyroid medication toxicity, you might probably won't see that frequently. Acute heart failure, uh, you'll learn this for OBGYN. Eclampsia, preeclampsia. You could have kidney problems, a stroke. Do you remember uh, what's it, what it's, it's, or head trauma, bleed in the head. Do you remember what's that called when you have a high blood pressure, low heart rate, irregular respirations, that high blood pressure, right? That's uh, Cushing syndrome, and this hypertensive crisis can lead to stroke. Uh, it can lead to a heart attack and pulmonary edema. So the protocol for hypertensive emergency um, is the number plus symptoms. All right, so systolic 220 or greater, diastolic 120 or greater. So depending on where you read, sometimes these numbers are different. But in North Carolina, this is what you're using: 220 over 120. All right, and then these symptoms. So how to treat this as a basic, not much you can do. ABCs, oxygen, pulse socks, position them, position of comfort. But the real thing is to call ALS because ALS can provide emergency treatment. All right, cardiac arrest. Now this is where CPR comes involved. And unfortunately due to the virus, we won't be having our CPR class uh, just yet but uh, stay tuned for the definitive treatment on, uh, about how to do CPR for cardiac arrest. But some other things, cardiac arrest means the heart is not beating, and when dead meat don't beat, the whole body is not getting oxygen. That means the whole body is infarcting and can lead to irreversible damage. So we need to uh, reperfuse the body um, and fix the heart. And so that's what CPR does, cardio pulmonary resuscitation. So chest compressions help circulate blood. Even if the heart's not beating, we can do it ourselves by squeezing the heart between the sternum and the spinal cord um, to eject blood out of the heart. We can give oxygen and ventilate these patients. So you'll learn all about how to do CPR later. So some general guidelines for cardiovascular emergencies. Always recognize a sense of urgency, right? Cardiac emergencies have very limited time windows I have the potential for um, for chronic morbidity and mortality um, if not definitive management is done at the hospital. All right. So sometimes medications may not relieve the problem and hypotension, hypoperfusion leads to shock for the whole body. So big problem. Everyone, right? ABCs, primary assessment, fix oxygenation, fix ventilation if you need to. Um, all patients your secondary assessment should include your sample, your OPQRST, so do you remember what these stand for? Remind yourself, onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, and time. 
do a focused physical, listen to heart and lungs, feel their belly. You might find that aneurysm. You might hear crackles in the. You might hear crackles for heart failure. You might find fluid overloaded in the legs. Always do vitals and then rapid transport. As with everyone, I'm not going to belabor these points, right? Scene safety, PPE, all that stuff. Um, mechanism, consider the nature of the illness based on their history of medical problems, right? If I'm a hypertensive smoker, diabetic, who's obese, who's sedentary, who's had three heart attacks, and I'm like telling you that this seems like my other heart attacks, it's likely maybe my chest pain's another heart attack. All right, so kind of fit all that stuff in together. But also know that these things can rapidly deteriorate. Primary assessment, um, everyone look at their responsiveness, M, A, B, Cs. Um, if someone is unresponsive, you'll learn in CPR how to, we change our order in CPR to do pulse and breathing at the same time. So, and you'll learn about AEDs, defibrillators. All right, if they are have abnormal breath sounds, you can always consider CPAP. All right, but if you do that, they need to have their, you have to make sure you, um, assess their airway. Assess the pulse and circulation, skin condition, color, temperature, moisture. Paleocal clammy is never good. Determine the rate, quality, regularity of the pulse. And then these are high priority patients who need to go to the hospital very quickly. And then also, um, we have a luxury in Chapel Hill in that you can't throw a rock without hitting a hospital, but depending on where you end up working, you may need to know differential transport uh, decisions based on the complaints. Because um, some some hospitals may be heart centers, some hospitals may be stroke centers, some hospitals that you could transport to can't do either, and so cardiac patients should ideally go to a heart center. Of course, here, UNC and Duke are both heart centers. Secondary assessment. So here are good. So so remember, what differentiates uh, good students from even better students is knowing the difference between just answering or asking sample questions as a formulaic um, checkboxy kind of thing. Like, do you have signs and symptoms, allergies, meds? No. But also knowing what other questions to ask that are pertinent. So just because we say do a history doesn't mean only do sample. It means ask other relevant questions. You're a detective trying to figure things out. So these are questions. These are examples of questions that could tell you more information, um, right? If you just ask someone, what's your history, your medical history, they may not know the answer or they may have different uh, ways to describe their medical history. But if you say specifically, have you ever had a heart attack? They're like, oh yeah, I did. But you know, that was only one time. And so it's not a history of it or something like that. So specifically asking questions can help you. All right. Kidney disease, meds. Has this ever happened before? Diabetes, you know, specific pertinent positives and negatives. Always do your OPQRST. All right. So let's go through those. So onset, what were you doing? Right. I would be more concerned for a more serious cardiac etiology um, if someone was having sudden onset pain when they were sitting there watching TV versus someone who was uh, running a marathon and had pain right when they started running, right? Because I mean, that, that's more exertional and uh, compared to someone who had sudden onset when they weren't doing exertion, right? Maybe the sudden onset chest pain that they have was they just got in a car accident and they have chest pain because they hit their chest against a steering wheel. Was there, has this ever ha happened before? Emotional stress, provocation, anything make it better or worse? Is it exertional? Does it, breathing, is it pleuritic? If I press on it, does it make it worse? Does leaning forward versus leaning back make it worse? Those things tell you information to lean you one way versus the other. Quality. What does it feel like? Is it burning, stabbing, ripping, dissection, ripping, tearing, dissection, right? Uh, radiation doesn't move anywhere. Cardiac pain, that visceral pain, if it moves, that could be concerning. Severity, a zero out of 10. Time, how long has it been going on? Does it come and go? Maybe they were mowing the lawn, they had pain, they sat down, it went away, they went back to mow the lawn, and it came back, and now it's persistent. Like that cadence of symptoms is important to know. All right, 
what is it better or worse in these uh, in in this kind of sequence? Physical exam. Your focus physical. Look at the neck. You see JVD consistent with heart failure. Do the belly. Do you see pulsations? Enlarged aortic aneurysm. Maybe you see pedal edema. Lung sounds, crackles, palpate the chest. Is it reproducible, that pain? Maybe you feel a, a rib fracture, right? Maybe you, maybe they have chest pain and then you look and you find a bullet wound. Yeah, expose them. Try to find these things. Um, look for uh, distended abdomen and pedal edema. Vital signs, everyone gets all vital signs. I'm not going to write blood pressure. These are vital signs. And then pulse ox, blood sugar. Uh, so one thing that you may encounter is if you can't go to a PCI, a primary heart center, um, within a reasonable amount of time, other hospitals that are not as um, equipped to deal with surgical interventions can maybe give something called a fibrinolytic which breaks up clots and it's a, it's a drug and this is you'll see this also for stroke uh, when we do our stroke lecture so um, there are very strict criteria of who can get fibrinolytics because it can be very dangerous to give people because it can cause bleeding understandably if you give someone a fibrinolytic so this is an alternative therapy that is not considered ideal for um, a heart attack the, the uh, PCI is considered gold standard, but if sometimes people don't have the options depending on where they live, transport um, parameters, uh, how long it's been, right? You can't ca you can't put someone in PCI if it's been uh, too long. Remember the four to six hours kind of thing. So you need to. Uh, this is just, no. This is another type of therapy that's not considered first line. So there are strict contraindications. You do not need to memorize this, but just this makes sense, right? If I need, if I give something that breaks up clots, I'm going to cause them to bleed, but the risk of them bleeding should be uh, far outweighed by the benefit of breaking that up. But that can sometimes the risk of bleeding can be bigger uh, than the the benefit of giving it. So if someone's actively bleeding and having an MI, you can't give fibrinolytics. Um, if they've had trauma, they just had surgery, they're internally bleeding, right? I can't be doing fibrinolytics for those people. These patients, do you think if they are high risk, they should be getting um, reassessed every five or 15 minutes, right? They're probably critical. You got to do every five. Repeat primary and then your interventions. So you're going to be probably giving these patients aspirin and nitro if you can to reassess their symptomatology with those. So just a quick follow-up on a primary assessment. I think Lynn got rid of the uh, case at the beginning, but whoever it is, they have a chief complaint of feeling like someone's standing on my chest. That sounds like typical angina to me. ANO times four, rapid breathing. We can fix that, give them oxygen. Pilical clammy, moist skin. I don't like that. No signs of injuries. You do a OPQRST. Sudden onset, that makes me more concerned. Nothing makes it better or worse, so even resting doesn't make it uh, better. So this leans me more towards an infarction rather than angina. Dull squeezing pain in the left arm, that sounds like the heart. Eight out of 10, 20 minutes ago, it's lasted a long time, even more towards an infarction. So what can we do? We do a sample, they have a history of hypertension. They were just eating a meal, so they weren't even exerting themselves, so that's bad. They have a prescription for nitro, so that's good. And they look pale, irregular pulse, that's not good. We do an exam, pearl pupils, no JVD, equal breath sounds, I'm reassured a little bit. High blood pressure, irregular pulse, satting on room air. And then we can call medical direction and give nitro and aspirin. So 324 aspirin, 0.4 milligrams, nitro, uh, Q five minutes times three if they are blood pressure remains elevated. Oh, that is not good. So then uh, we call ALS and we do CPR. So we'll talk about that when you do CPR. 
ALS arrives and asks you a really uh, snarky question of where you are with your arrest management, and you just uh, tell them that you did BLS. ALS can do a whole bunch of other things. They can do intubation, they can do IVs, they can give meds to the IVs, all that stuff. And then you get pulses back on this guy, and then he does well. Great. All right. Uh, okay. So, uh, remember, if you have any questions, that wraps up our lectures for makeup of Tuesday the 17th. Um, so feel free to email me if you have any questions about the content in this lecture. Um, on Thursday the 19th, you should be doing... Um, I'll, I'll go over some basic EKGs. We'll talk about um, resuscitation briefly, and I'll do respiratory emergencies uh, for you for for us to stay on track for EMS class. Um, it's going to be very lecture heavy, recorded lectures. All right, all right. You all have a good day. Survivors will meet on Thursday for our lectures.